Welcome back to Apex's Tech Summit. I'm Madeline Milka, President and CEO. Our next session in the program is Tech Leading in the World of Content. We'll be joined for this session by Albert Chen, CEO, uh, COO of Amazon Studios, and Jay Trinidad, General Manager Direct to Consumer for Disney, to discuss the combining of content creation and technology. Before we get started, allow me to introduce our session's welcoming speaker, Representative Ted Liu of California's 33rd Congressional District. Congressman Liu is a member of the Judiciary Committee, where he sits on the Subcommittee on Intellectual Property and the Internet. He's also a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, serving as WIP. Please welcome Congressman Ted Liu. Hello. I'm so honored to be here uh, and look forward to hearing this amazing panel uh, where we have Edmund Lee from New York Times moderating uh, this panel with Albert Cheng of Amazon Studios and Jay Trinidad of Disney. I just want to say I am blessed to represent this amazing district in Southern California where we have both tech uh, and content. And this panel is about exactly those two issues. I think it's instructive to see that you have a number of tech companies uh, that have come down to Southern California, not necessarily because they need computer science majors, and by the way, I am a recovering computer science major, uh, but because they wanted to get content. And that's why we have an entire Silicon Beach uh, that is growing uh, in the Santa Monica, Venice area. We recently saw that Apple uh, has expanded its footprint uh, in uh, the Southern California, Los Angeles area. I'm very pleased and proud that Amazon Studios is headquartered in my district in Santa Monica. And what you're seeing is tech companies who realize they don't just need software programmers, they need people that can come in and tell stories and do uh, graphic design and uh, do things that can capture you emotionally and to make sure uh, that when they put out their video games, uh, that it's not just software that is uh, preeminent, but also their entire story and background for that video game. So here today, we're going to listen from this amazing panel. I look forward to uh, hearing what all of you have to say. And as we head out uh, into the 21st century, it's important that we understand that you cannot stop technology, but you can shape it. And in some cases, you may have to regulate it if it's doing damage, but it's going to keep on marching forward. And I look forward to all the exciting new products that we're going to experience and see. And let me conclude by thanking Madeline and Apex for all that you do uh, in leading the way to make sure that America is even uh, an even better place uh, to live, work, and play. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and taking the time to join us, Congressman Liu. We greatly appreciate it. I'd like to now hand things over to Edmund Lee, Assistant Editor at the New York Times, who will be conducting our interviews. Edmund. All right. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm Edmund Lee. Um, I am an editor at the New York Times and also corporate media reporter. Uh, this is Albert Cheng with me. Uh, Albert, what's your title exactly? What do you, you have a pretty big title at Amazon Studios. What, yeah, what well, it's actually pretty, pretty simplified. It's, uh, it's, I'm the chief operating officer of Amazon Studios. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's a nice, yeah. nice big title. <laughs> <laughs> um, so welcome. This is great. Um, we'll have um, hopefully a, a, a lively discussion here about entertainment, streaming, the digital media ecosystem, Asian American representation and identity, you know, all in 30 minutes or less. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll tackle it all, um, or at least we'll, we'll, we'll have enough of an interesting discussion that I think will hopefully provoke and stoke other discussions amongst people. Um, so Amazon Studios is, has become uh, a very significant player in Hollywood. Um, not too long ago, it you know had its original certainly that um, uh, made a splash both on the award scene, but just sort of in Hollywood in general. But it was sort of kind of more of a curiosity for a lot of uh, people in entertainment. Like, is how serious is Amazon about entertainment? Of course, Jeff Bezos has all the money in the world, but you know what does he really want to do with it? And then of course, over time, slowly it became clear that oh, they're they're very committed to entertainment and spending tons of money and probably will be spending even more money <laughs> on funding content. Um, and sort of the the framework around all this is, of course, what Netflix um, has done to the industry. And what I say has done, um, it's really recast how 
Hollywood productions are done, where how distribution works, where the audiences are. And Netflix really took advantage of this idea of, you know what, people like watching stuff when they want to watch them at home, not necessarily in theaters, um, not necessarily on a schedule, without commercials. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, spent tons and tons of money spending upwards of 20 billion a year to fund original content or to license content. Uh, and Amazon, I suspect, is probably not that far behind. You guys don't really divulge how much money you spend. So actually, this is a question I'm going to ask you, since you, you probably someone who would know how much money do you guys spend on content or how close can you ex get to explaining like what the scope of that is anyway? Yeah, I'm sorry, Edmund, I won't be able to help you out there and divulge <laughs> how much we spend, but we do, um, but it is a significant investment and it is something that we want to make sure that we are applying and obviously creating great content for prime customers. I think that's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do and provide, you know, uh, benefits that uh, our customers would get as, as a subscriber of prime. So that's actually a great way to explain sort of the, the overarching picture. Um, you know, I've heard Jeff Bezos on on at presentations um, and and talking about why Prime Video is essential or key to how Prime itself works. So Prime, as most people know, is a subscription service. I have it. A lot of people I know have it. Basically, you're you're paying a monthly fee to get. Um, you know, faster shipping, cheaper shipping, or no, you know, no cost shipping on a lot of items. Um, and part of how Prime Video works is, you know, Prime Video comes as a part of that that cost or that that package, so to speak. Um, and you know, frankly, a lot of people who have Prime may not be aware that Prime Video is a part of it. They are becoming more aware of it. But explain to us, Albert, what's the reason? What is the connection between having Prime Video? And what that means for prime customers and the whole prime delivery sort of infrastructure like why is one important to the other yeah i think well i think the main thing it stems from the primary core of what we're trying to do <clears throat> which is having being so obsessed to run customers that we want to make sure that we're delivering something that they want and when you think about prime it's a multiple benefit membership meaning <clears throat> there are a lot of things that come with it and hopefully uh, as as a package there will be something in that that in that membership that people will you know want to subscribe to and video is one of many of them and it depends on where you are in the country or where you, where you are around the world <clears throat> but video plays a role for some people in bigger ways and some people in lesser ways but i think the idea is if you provide enough benefits around a very simple subscription price then <clears throat> you'll be able to appeal to a fairly large number of people and hopefully we continue to de deliver that value on customers so you know Every, uh, it depends on who you might be. Uh, the shipping might be the benefit. For someone else, it might be the video. Uh, it could be something else that comes with the, with, the, uh, with the Prime membership. But I think the idea is how much value can we offer the customer so that they remain a, 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 a loyal Prime member. And, and that's kind of the ultimate goal. So there's a virtuous cycle between the two. In other words, one, it, it benefits consumers as value that way, but also benefits Amazon I mean, in the sense that, you know, Prime video potentially helps to drive more shoes of sales i mean more more sales of shoes rather right or anything else right that they help each other out it could be yeah. yeah yeah okay. it could be that's the idea i mean that that I, I only say that because that is something that i know uh jeff bezos has said um you know prime video helps to sell more shoes on amazon you know he was being very blunt about that i think that's more nuanced of course but there's a benefit to both sides there's value to users um, as a prime subscriber, but there's also value to Amazon in terms of, oh, you know, it drives more sales. So right. it's not like traditional. The reason why I bring that up is it's not like traditional Hollywood, where, as we've seen what's happened to the box office, traditional Hollywood makes its money through selling movie tickets, um, selling cable subscriptions where, you know, you're, you're part of that ecosystem and they get money back for that. Ultimately, you know, that money flows back to the studios, the flows back to the talent. Um, but for Amazon, I mean, the money, you know, the way that the money flows is not necessarily about, of course, the talent is going to be well compensated, I, I, I assume, I presume, um, but that the, the, the benefit ultimately is to this virtuous cycle, this, this sort of prime ecosystem that Amazon is creating. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, ultimately, we're still held to a, a you know, a P&L, like any other business. So ah, there you uh, go. So we you, are, you do want to be profitable yeah. in as, as a potential standalone or as its own sort of entity. So how do you, that's why I want to get to him because there are slightly different metrics or slightly different measures of success. How do you guys measure success at Amazon Studios? Yeah, I mean, it, it gets down to, um, uh, there are a lot of smart data scientists and economists to help figure that out. So, and I can't probably get into how that works, but 
um, there is a way for us to kind of you know measure how we're performing. But ultimately, the metrics that are most important to us are you know how much content is being consumed, how many of our customers are actually watching the content. Um, of the total prime package, you know, how much is the benefit being used versus all the others? <laughs> I mean, that's for us uh, is a, a measurement of our success within, you know, the broader subscription package. So um, these are things we look at. You know, we always want to make sure that we have as many people watching and as frequently as possible. And in, more importantly, how many more uh, prime customers can we attract uh, into, into subscribing to primes? So these are all very basic measures that anyone would want to see in terms of you know how our our specific benefit is performing within the overall um, you know offering that we have to customers. So as an example for you know the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which uh, you know our family watches, we we like it a lot. Um, if the so by word of mouth or by you know sort of the fact that it's won all these awards, it helps to drive new Prime subscribers. Oh, I heard about that. I heard I have to watch it. They sign up for Prime because they didn't have it before. Oh, and by the way, we get free shipping with with a lot of Amazon items now. On top of that, that counts as sort of a win for you guys, right? In terms Absolutely. of a studio win, right? How Absolutely. Grow? Okay, there you go. So that, that's one way to measure. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I bring this up is because a big part of not just you guys, but of course Netflix has changed sort of the economics of Hollywood. And what I mean by that is there's, it's sort of two-sided, right? I, I've heard stories anecdotally of, you know, Hollywood producers, TV producers, showrunners who say, you know what, I actually love being on streaming because the metrics are different. I don't need to be a rating success in the first week, you know, when the show airs. If it takes time for it to, to, to find its audience, that's great. And also they're willing to fully fund the, the, the first season, you know, that it's not about just waiting to see if like a few episodes hit and then we'll get a, a subsequent season. It's like, oh, wow, we can we can we can have a little bit more time. The other side of it, though, at the same time, is that, you know what? I don't know how to value my show exactly. Am I getting paid what I what the show is really worth? Because the metrics are different. We don't see these Nielsen ratings necessarily um, for streaming shows the way that you do for traditional television. So what's your experience with that with Amazon Studios? How how have the talent reacted to you guys coming in with, with big paychecks or presumably big enough paychecks as well as sort of this, the metrics of like, is a success or is it not success? What, how are they reacting to you guys? Yeah, I think, you know, like any other, I think what's, let me start off with sort of what's different about streaming and especially that sort of makes it a little bit harder is that, um, you know, if you look at traditional media, uh, we, we, we lived in a world where, con, you know, shows and films were distributed by territory, by the near you know, platforms by broadcast platforms, it was very fragmented, right? In terms of like the windowing and how the a title would basically pass through the system and capture economics along the way. Um, with streaming, you're really looking at, it is a truly a global business, right? So a streamer uh, with, a, with a significant amount of scale, with a significant amount uh, of coverage, you essentially can uh, fund a film or a television series without really thinking about the various windows and different ways to monetize the content. It's just one shot and you can have it on, on demand. And also the life of the, of the title is, is behaves a little bit differently because um, there's a, it, it lives on video on demand for quite a bit of time. It right. could be in perpetuity or for a longer license period. And so the, the nature of the business has changed so much in that it is difficult to value the economics now because you only have you know, one service. But I think, you know, over the last, you know, probably, geez, how, you know, we've been like almost 10 years at this point doing this between Netflix, between us, and a lot of, we've always figured out the economics on how we wanted to, um, you know, value the various components of making a show, including how do we value uh, recognizing talent. And it has changed a lot. I mean, it continues to change because I think we're all learning how this is evolving. So, you know, streamers don't know exactly how things will turn out. And so, Hopefully, as as the industry involves, and, and I can guarantee you that everything that we thought of today will probably change tomorrow. Because as the market matures, the behaviors of customers, the behaviors of the economics start to change over time, and you have to kind of calibrate and figure out um, how how the relationships will work between talent and and our businesses. And so, um, what I can say is that we've you know. We've, everyone's come to some agreement. Um, sometimes things change and they don't always, uh, they often reflect, they often reflect of what we thought back then as opposed to what it is now. And so I do definitely think that this will constantly evolve. And I think as the industry shifts even more, 
I think we're all going to have to figure out like, well, how does this all work out? Because ultimately, um, we everyone, we all want to make great uh, films and t television series, and of, of course, everyone wants to be adequately, um, you know, recognized economically for that, financially recognized for that. We just need to figure out what that right model is, and I think we we'll have we'll have to see how this evolves. We still haven't settled there, I think, on, on what if that is. Partly because, I mean, it's becoming more competitive, right? Is mm -hmm. that fair to say? I mean, between you guys and Netflix and the traditional studios and the traditional studios are actually spending more now because they have their own streaming services, right? And so ha has it just become more competitive for, for talent and for producers and for even things like prop equipment? You know, I heard that there's, you know, Netflix, for example, you know, sort of, uh, sort of kind of cordons off a lot of the infrastructure ahead of time, even not without knowing what they might necessarily be filming, like studio space, et cetera. Is it just that much more competitive? I, I think it's competitive because we're, we're definitely, everyone's in build mode. We're building, right. you know, the country, the, all these companies are in build mode and um, and it's coming, it's happening at such a fast rate, right? And if you look at legacy media that took decades of content and investment and a lot of that's being done in a very accelerated timeline. So when you have a lot of companies trying to make as much content as possible, you're, you do have a capacity issue um, and, and talent and scarcity issue. And I think, uh, as I said before, what's changed is the dynamics is that, you know, streamers are global and the, the ability to monetize that investment on that, on that level of scale is much clearer when you, have when you have a global footprint. I think it's a little bit harder when you don't, and you definitely have to be a long-term thinker to say, okay, I'm going to make that bet because I think I'm going to get the footprint in order to kind of help monetize, you know, the investment um, better. But I think if you have a global footprint, like Netflix and like us, you know, we have a better sense of how much we should be paying and how much we can be paying and what we're willing to pay in order to kind of help, you know, build. In other business. words, the per subscriber cost, right, um, is sort of potentially lower because you've got a much bigger, um, better, pool. yeah, business, exactly, yeah, exactly. Right. better, yeah, yeah, much bigger pool of, of potential viewers or viewers. Is that what the MGM bet is about. You guys paid, what, nearly $9 billion for MGM, which was a surprise to many, uh, to close media watchers. It wasn't such a surprise. In fact, everyone's wondering what's taking Amazon so long to buy more um, Hollywood stuff. So is that what MGM signifies? What the capacity issue, as well as sort of the long-term investment idea that you're talking about? I think MGM has, uh, you know, as a, it's a great company, I think that the idea of, you know, uh, Amazon being able to help uh, sort of preserve the legacy of the MGM library and the IP and the and the great people that work there in terms of like what can we do with this uh, given that you know we are we are in it for the long haul and the uh, the MGM studio has had a long story history of great content great content making great storytellers and great great titles so just the the fact that we wanted to make sure that we um, are able to help uh, offer those to our customers either in its original form or potentially adapting them, uh, these are always something that's attractive to us. And I think the idea of, you know, being able to help, um, you know, help retain and build on top of that library is only more compelling to us, it's especially as long-term investors of, of uh, creating stories for customers and for everyone to see around the world. And uh, and we've always sort of, you know, Amazon Studios, when we formed that, that's one of the things that we always wanted to to have the industry understand is that we may be a new technology company, but we do understand the legacy of great storytelling, great talent, great art, great commercial art, that um, we're just, we're, we're looking at our company as a way to take it to the next phase of its growth into the future and into technology. And so, you know, we just built, um, we just finally built and finished uh, our lot in Culver City and it's on a very right. historical mansion. And when you look at the mansion, which is sort of like the, the anchor of, of our lot, and then you see behind the mansion is sort of these really, you know, modern looking um, offices and studio uh, facilities, you know, it's just sort of a, a nod to, you know, noting and, and acknowledging history, but also saying, you know, we're here to also help build the future, uh, the future on top of the great history and hopefully we'll create something amazing for, you know, for customers. What one of the big parts of the MGM history, one of the big sort of libraries is, the, of course, the Bond library, James Bond, you know, which the latest film just debuted this past weekend. Um, what's interesting about that library is it's it's not entirely owned by MGM. It's jointly owned between MGM and the Broccoli family. And there's been questions about, well, what's how is that relationship going to work? How, how are you going to move forward? Are you going to try to create even more sort of 
iterations around that franchise and the and the broccoli family estate is very protective of course of of the character and and that whole world what's the plan there what's the thinking well it's still early we're not we're not the, the acquisition okay. hasn't closed so i um, can't really comment on um, what could happen but um what I, what i will say about it is that uh you know, we're from a, we, we do have very, a, a good point of vision of where we see future, the future of entertainment going. Um, but we're also a home for talent, meaning that, you know, we, one of the things that's so important to us is be, to be able to work with creators uh, like the Barclays and really kind of get to a point where, um, you know, we understand where we're, where we're coming from and being able to like create new things. So it, it, we are a home for talent. We, we were, we're here to listen. We definitely want to make sure that things work. Um, it's, it's a collaboration, it's a partnership in everything we do, even at Amazon Studios, forget, you know, uh, not even including MGM, we've always been a studio that's been focused on how do we partner with talent and our creators to make sure that we are uh, introducing to the world the best version of itself. And so that may entail a number of different distribution models, I mean, entail streaming, you know, all these things are within the tool set of what we talk about with our creators. And the most important thing is that conversation, like what's the best thing for this, for this for this title in other words you guys aren't widget makers you're not coming in to, to hollywood to to do spreadsheet analysis around stories and storytelling you, yeah. you want to right you want to get it right i think clearly of all the things you guys have been producing that that's been that has been borne out and other things that people are looking forward to the lord of the rings sort of uh, franchise which you guys spent hundreds of millions of dollars producing uh, everyone's looking forward to that and very anxious to see that. Can you can you give us a little win, uh, insight as to how that how that's shaping up and and what to expect? Yeah, uh, I can't say anything either. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you can't. But, uh, yeah, I will right. say I will say um, we're really excited about it. Uh, we have some great uh, showrunners and producers on this project. We wanted to make sure that we hired the best of the best, and there's been a lot of care. Um, you know, making a show that scale nature is never easy and it's tough i think you know having also having to do it during the middle of the pandemic is not easy uh so i am excited i think fans will be thrilled uh and we're just just can't wait to release it so hopefully you know we're just we're waiting for it to to show up gotcha um the last topic i really want to tackle and i know we're sort of running short on time but we can sort of solve this whole thing in about five or six minutes asian american rep representation right yeah. <laughs> um it's a it's a big topic it's not just asian american representation but representation for all kinds of communities that typically aren't seen either in front or behind the camera um but when we talk about asian american identity um asian american community i mean we certainly see more of it than ever before right and thanks in part to streaming thanks in part to that there are that many more players involved uh as a studio executive you know how do you see amazon's role in that um not just asian american representation but representation overall are we getting better at it like are we being more conscious of how we do that um i know some of the big studios have sort of these not quotas, but they're looking at the numbers. They're very consciously trying to, to see like, how many people are we hiring? How many people, how many shows do we have where, you know, a Lily character happens to be, you know, Asian American, for example, that kind of thing. Is that something you guys think about? Oh yeah, it's a top, it's a priority for us. Okay. I think, um, you know, we, and it goes back down to, you know, one of our Amazon leadership principles of customer obsession. You have to be extraordinarily aware that, you know, our customer base is very diverse. It's a very broad spectrum of all of all kinds of people. And so in order to be able to be an effective business, you need to be able to, to attract them and, and, and uh, address the needs of those, of those customers. And I think one of the things across the board uh, is that any traditional media company or any, anything we see media today severely under indexes on uh, underrepresented communities, right? So um, Asian American, Latinx, um, Black, you know, Native Americans for sure. I mean, yeah. and you just keep going down the line and uh, we just need to do a better job of making sure that we are putting out, putting out films and television series that do reflect in aggregate, right? So it's not to say that every single title needs to be adequately represented it because sometimes the story doesn't lend itself, but you do have to look at the overall investment of what we're making. And are we truly uh, offering a slate of, of, of titles that essentially reflect what people see in themselves and in their communities and in their homes. So um, that's super important to us. We came out with an inclusion policy play, playbook for Amazon Studios that actually has pretty uh, tight goals. These are all guidelines, 
course, you know, we, we're trying to strive for that. But I think what's important is that um, we are working with partners and creators that also believe in the same thing. When we sign someone to a deal, you know, we want to make sure that they feel just as strongly about, you know, representation and holding ourselves accountable to make sure that we are thinking about these conversation. Um, even even the content that we create, things that come up, you know, you know, we have to look at how are we representing communities? Is this a fair representation? Are we quickly going into a place where, you know, we're just doing the same thing? Lots of conversation. Are we there yet? We're not there yet. This takes a long time. Um, we're investing, and it's really important to invest in people and creators. So we have deals with Nina Yang, Bian Jovi, Daniel Day Kim, Stephen Young. Uh, the list goes on in terms of API. API. We're, we're just fit, about to fit, or we're still in the middle of production with a, a television series that Lulu Wong is directing and, and has adapted. Um, so we're just, um, uh, which takes place in Hong Kong. So there's there's a lot of um, efforts, but it takes a while get there and I'm excited because to what comes there, yeah. production cycle takes a while of course it, it, we know that um i think that um one of the things that sometimes can be tricky around these things is i've noticed there are many more asian american executives in hollywood yourself included um asian americans have certainly been rising up through the ranks um and at the same time you kind of wonder well there is sort of better representation behind the camera and in the executive suites which is great but is that does that always reflect in the end product? You know, do we see that all the time? And I think sometimes there is this weird, well, like I don't necessarily want to green light this show just because I'm Asian and they're Asian. Like, is there that, or is it more sort of the gung ho? Oh, yeah, let's definitely tell this story. I understand what the story is about, is because there's always sort of that tricky sort of maybe false balance around that. Is that do you, do you encounter that? Do you see that? No, I think it's. Uh, I think I. I tend to over-index. I mean, and, and push it, which is like, uh, why are there, you know, the typical people being cast in these, and why are we not? Where are there Asian stories? So, uh, definitely push really hard. And sometimes, what it comes down to, I think, is, um, you know, uh, supply and demand, right? So I think, mm -hmm. you know, you have. Um, and and the earnest and the, the amount of work you actually do have to put in there and invest in talent. So, you know, I, I don't think there there's probably a lot of really good writers. There's a lot of there's probably not enough showrunners that are Asian American. Like these are things that require systemic investment because right. we're at this we're at the point where there's a there's a level of creative execution that you sort of have to meet. Like even if you're Asian, but if your writing doesn't quite hit that, it's really hard for someone, even like myself, to say, yeah, the, Asian, the writer's Asian, but the material isn't good enough, you know, for, for someone to move forward. And I think we are sort of behind I, in the sense that we could use a lot more. And I would actually put out there as like, I don't think there's enough Asian American creative executives or executives in Hollywood. Okay, <laughs> I mean, there, there, no, there you go. There's, you know there's, better than I do. Yes, you know, you, 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 you could right. say, yeah, oh, there's more. It's like, mm, I'm not, not sure quite enough. Yeah. Not enough, right? And so... And I would say the same thing with Latinx, really, really a dearth of Latinx executives we need a lot more. And but what happens is there's a default, which is those that are currently there are constantly being asked to do things, right? And there's, there's a little bit of imbalance because it's like, uh, there's probably a handful of prominent Asian actors that I think everyone gravitates towards, but there's probably like hundreds more that are waving their hands saying, hey, give me a shot. I'm over here, um, right. Exactly. Yep, and, and I think that that's definitely true. We, we have to do a little bit more of that. And the question is, how do we well, how do we have enough titles and content that are, that's being produced to allow uh, actors to get more experience in front of the camera and get noticed? That's the thing, right? Sort of like there's sort of a, there's sort of a, a supply and demand issue of like, well, there's clearly a demand, but we know there's a supply. The question is, how do we meet and figure out how we can give opportunities to see how they can move up the, the ladder. And I think that is, that is a, for Asian actors and actresses, it is definitely casting. You have to, you know, I oversee casting at studios. It's the most important thing is like, I need to make sure that holistically we are giving people a shot. We don't always go for the same actor, right. you know, for that same role. Type, same type of story, same type of sort of that whole, right. right, Amelia, I get it. and. You know, as, as Asian Americans, we, we I think a lot there's a very similar story, especially amongst upwardly mobile Asian Americans of, you know, parents want us to go into medicine or law or engineering, <laughs> something safe. And then we end up doing something completely different. They're like, what happened? And then all of a sudden you find people, you know, making shows and, and, and films and writing books and um, being a journalist, which is my parents at first were like, is, can you make any money doing that? So uh, <laughs> I, I think to your point, to your to your 
experience. We need more people in that in that business. Um, so stop it with the doctors and lawyers already. <laughs> Go to Hollywood right now. I know. Yeah. Right now. Well, the, the amount of conversations I've had with my parents and people me when I was entered this business, uh, it, was, it was a nightmare for them. <laughs> okay. And I think it was a nightmare for them for at least 25 years until where I am now. I'm telling you, it didn't take, it took 25 years for them to finally figure out, oh yeah, I guess it's okay that you did this. It's like, yeah, because it turned out okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. It only took that long. No, I know Asian parents are tough. <laughs> they're, not, they're not easy to please. Yeah. Um, but hey, Albert, you are a great example of, of that kind of success and that kind of, uh, that intuition and that, that, that just sticking to it, I guess, right, is the best way to put it. And you know what, I, I think that's, that's awesome. Hopefully that can inspire others to, to follow that same path um, or a similar path. And um, this was a, a great conversation and a great sort of insight into how things are really working in Hollywood these days. Right. Well, lots, lots to come. And all I can say to folks that are like, it's the most important thing is to do what you love. I love, I love entertainment. I love watching it. It's probably what I always do anyway, as I watch everything. Um, and I'm just lucky enough to be able to find a job where I love being at work. And I think when you love something, you automatically will be good at it because you put in the hours, your 10,000 hours or whatever it might be. Right. And so I think too many times Asian parents will tell them what they want you to be. And it may not be what you love. It may not be what you love or it's something you don't love. And then you're not going to put in the hours and then yeah. you're not going to succeed. So I think that's the one thing that I wish that people could you know, think about in terms of what really drives their, their vote because they'll wind up doing well. Lessons for us all. Um, yeah. Great. I really appreciate the time. This is uh, this is a conversation. Hope, hopefully we can do it again. All right. Thanks, Edmund. All right. Okay. Take care, guys. All right. Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I am Edmund Lee of the New York Times, and we have with us Jay Trinidad um, of Disney, which is one probably I want to say is the largest media company, at least in the United States, probably the world. If we really want to uh, count the chips, um, <laughs> Jay, thanks for joining us. Um, so, just really quick, what what do you do at Disney? What's your role there? Exactly. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I am the head of Disney Plus for Asia Pacific. Um, so um, basically my job every day is to see if we can delight more customers through our streaming service. Okay, so it sounds really s simple and straightforward, but that's actually a pretty big deal, Disney Plus. <laughs> um, unless you've been you know, under a rock for the past few years. <laughs> is, uh, yeah, right. It's, it's, it's a big streaming service that, uh, you know, that our family has, that I know a lot of families have. Thank you. Um, there you go. We pay money for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, as do a lot of other people, as do millions of other people. Um, and it's it's very new. It's it's not uh, something that's been around for like a decade or, or more the way that Netflix has. Absolutely. Um, and in a lot of ways, Disney jumping into the streaming game really signaled sort of traditional Hollywood or traditional media companies sort of jump into the streaming world because... Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was a move a little bit away from theatrical. It's a move a, away from sort of cable pay television uh, uh, ecosystem, which is what is the more usual traditional way that we get our media in the States. Um, right. Right. And this is direct to consumer. And you, you're 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 a, a big player now, not just in the U.S., but quickly you guys gain steam around the world, including in Asia. So that's right. That's right. That I want to ask sort of right off the bat, like that is fascinating to me because you know disney is of course a well-known brand around the world um but when it comes to entertainment when it comes to you know content for lack of a better word for a more all-encompassing word i mean yeah. regional flavors you know regional sort of kind of tastes matter right so Absolutely. uh you guys started with a deep library of disney lucasfilm pixar um Absolutely. stuff which is great marvel of course right is a Absolutely. huge part of that so that has we know that has mass appeal, but is how that has have there been challenges trying to get Disney Plus into the homes of consumers across Asia, or what have those challenges been? I think that um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that as you mentioned, Disney has the wonderful privilege, and I consider it my privilege to kind of you know entertain you know the world essentially. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic privilege, and I think um, 
I think, um, you know, along with that comes a variety of challenges that you mentioned. Right. Um, I think specifically for Asia, um, the, the, there's a couple things I think are universal and that are specific to Asia. I think the first one, uh, there's three I would say. First I would say is that, you know, I think that the, the Asian audience is very, uh, how do you say, um, very particular in that they, they are very interested in content of their own. So, yeah. you know, if you go to if you go to Korea, like, you know, six of the top 10 or seven of the top 10 are local Korean content. Right. If you go to Japan, you know, same thing. You see anime, you see like six or seven of the top 10 pieces of most viewed content are Japanese in Japanese with Japanese faces, right? Um, um, and with Japanese flavor in Japanese language, right? Um, you get it's it's a little bit less so as you go to places like Singapore or Australia, New Zealand or um, you know, those markets, but you have some very hyper, hyper local uh, markets. So I think that's the first big challenge is like, you know, of course, they still enjoy like, you know, the Eternals or Iron Man or, you know, um, or the rest of that. But I do think in addition to enjoying those um, kind of globally relevant titles, they are very hyper critical. I think the second one is, um, you know, you have varying infrastructure across the region. So if you go to a place like Japan or Korea, they've got some of the fastest internet in the world. I mean, they make the U.S. look like a snail sometimes <laughs> when it comes to internet speeds, right? Um, right. But uh, but I think that you know it, you also have other places that are much more earlier in their kind of like jump towards that, right? So if you look at if you look at some of the developing markets in the region, you know how do we deliver content when it's not a you know 10, 15, 100 right. gigabit connection over the air? Um, streaming video is very bandwidth extensive, you know, intensive, right? And so. I think there are technology challenges on top. Like, how do we make sure that we're delivering the optimal file size to, you know, maybe not an iPhone, but maybe like not an iPhone 13, but maybe a Android six generations ago right. that's, and still get that kind of crisp. So I think there's a technology and a infrastructure challenge um, that varies across the region. And then I think third is, um, you know, there are varying um, how do you say this, um, regulatory environments um, right. that we have to operate in within the market. And so you have places, um, you know, like, you know, Japan, which have specific rating systems, like Korea has a specific rating system that they operate in. Um, you know, um, you know, you have um, Singapore that has its own rating system. So we have to basically, you know, we have to stay legal. Obviously, nobody wants to go to jail, um, you know, and so we stay legal in each of the regulatory environments. And we, for Disney, it's a little bit easier given our content um, profile. Um, right. You know, there there is a there is we're increasingly moving into general entertainment, um, and so as we move into general entertainment, that regulatory framework, we have to make sure we're we're adhering to that. You know, as it varies by market. So I think those are the three big challenges for us, right? That makes complete sense. Um, yeah. You do talk about sort of, um, you know, in the local markets, they they gravitate yeah. towards their own local type content, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how how so how are you guys solving for that? I mean, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Netflix, we know it's been around for a long time. Yeah. They their strategy has been and it's it's been uh, come to the fore more recently that they've set up shop in Korea, sort of their base around Asia. Um, right. to create content because they see Korea as sort of a good jumping off point because, you know, Korean dramas appear to be very popular across Asia it, as well yeah. as Korea itself. Uh, I'm sure, of course, if you go to certain regions, maybe it's not quite as popular as, as as maybe some of the local content, but it's a good starting point, at least anyway. We've heard about Squid Game, which, you know, apparently is the most watched <laughs> thing on that platform around the world, not just in, in one region, but all together, yeah. period, which no one expected. Uh, so it kind of proves proves out that point a little bit, right? For right. creating original content or for creating, you know, for content specific to to the region, what are you guys doing? How are you guys taking care of that? I, I mean, I think for Disney, actually, it's surprisingly simple and straightforward. Which is Disney at its heart, you know, we are a storytelling company, like a content company. That's kind of our heritage um, here, and that's what we do best. That's our core strength. Um, and I think that that's kind of how we're approaching it, which is how can we be the home of the best, the world's best stories, right? And 
that maybe, you know, that might be again, like, you know, the Avengers, which is one of the world's best stories in my opinion. Um, or it can be a local Korean drama or, you know, a Japanese anime. Like, I think those in their own right are some of the world's best stories, right? Um, and so I think that, um, and I think that each market has some of those stories to be told. And our philosophy, I think, doesn't change in that sense, which is, you know, as you can see from various content, we believe it can go both ways. We believe that some of that content can be generated in the US and spread around the world, and which is increasingly, and I think what we're seeing more now is it can also be created here in Asia, because I'm, I'm actually in Seoul right now, um, that, now that you mentioned that. Right. Uh, I'm calling you in from, I'm, we're, we're, we're doing this call from Seoul, and um, you know we, we fervently believe that I think some of those world-class stories can be exported from here to the rest of the world as well. So we're, we're actively um, creating content within the region that we hope will obviously do well in region, but be exported um, beyond. And so that's interesting. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're still used to thinking of Disney as, as sort of this very much Disney brand of, of the stuff that we've seen from the States that yeah. of course does travel around the world, but you Absolutely. guys are jumping into locally derived content that, that you hope will have a, a global appeal. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to be in a press conference tomorrow where we're going to be announcing a huge slate of local content um, that's going to be generated in region here in Asia, proudly. Um, and that will be, um, you know, we hope uh, compelling to cons customers within these markets, which are very particular, um, as well as other markets who love this type of content. Yeah. Including in the state. So like, would I be able to watch some of this stuff once once this stuff uh, that's, reaches that's the platform? Right. That's okay, right. So Again, it's going to vary by licensing, obviously, but well, so that was my other question. I mean, uh, with with these productions, even if you guys are the the primary funders of it, I mean, a lot of times it's a licensing deal, which is you have the rights for either certain regions for certain periods of time, or you own it outright. Yeah, uh, which is sort of the Netflix strategy, where you know it's just in their library forever, and anyone around the world can watch it. So, how do yeah. you balance that? Yeah. What how do you approach that in terms of uh, these kinds of original productions? Again, we're just going to go after the best stories we can grab, right? Um, and some of those we will be able to, we'll catch them early enough where we get to produce them outright, right? Um, and in other ones, you know, they're they're on the shelf and we want to grab those um, and because they are compelling stories, right? Um, and so I think that's why it's going to be a variety. Um, but, you know, to the extent that we can, obviously, we'd like to make sure that we can we can show all the content to the world, you know? Got it. Uh, yeah. Um, well, and then, so... In line with that, I mean, can you talk to sort of the general overall popularity of of Asian films and television um, across the world? I mean, we, we tend to think of, you know, Hollywood is still sort of in many ways the totem of it, of entertainment for, for global right. audiences, right? Uh, right? That in a lot of ways is, has been shifting, right? Um, mm -hmm. India has long been a huge center for for uh, filmmaking uh, for yeah. decades and big fan of Bollywood, yeah, big Bollywood fan of is huge, yeah. and they have some of the biggest audiences for for any kind of cinema. It travels a little bit, maybe not quite as much as some other cinema. And I know Disney has Disney Hotstar uh, in India, right. which is its own service. Um, but in general, overall, like, what's your sense of it? Because Disney is is a global player. Disney Plus is a global yeah. player. How how big are the expectations for the for the people back at Burbank, you know, to for what mm. you you and your team are going to be producing for the, the platform? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think two things. It's, you know, it, businesses tend to follow the consumer, right? And, and Disney is no different. We, we hear, right? So again, our, our first and foremost, you know, goal is to delight the customer. And again, I, as I mentioned, like, it's our privilege to do that um, for like, you know, as one of the biggest in the world, uh, media uh, distributors and creators, um, and so I think that I think that there are billions of Asian consumers, right, you know, for for right. this, right? Um, and so and so I think that if we if we do our job right and create compelling stories, there will be naturally, a, you know, at least as a first place to go, billions of Asian consumers that will be, um, you know, anxious to get some of the, their hands on some of that content. We believe. And then again, if we do our job really right, um, these stories will resonate beyond simply, you know, the market that they are created in, and they are then transcendent to actually human stories um, that people can relate to the world over, um, and then can spread to the rest of the world. So I think that, you know, on, on its face, and I should, another way to say it is, on its face, obviously there will be specific markets that will be like, you know, Bollywood and India. 
um, you know, um, Japanese anime in Japan. But as we all know, both of those genres travel very well given the population that they have, and even beyond their native communities, um, they it's it's really fascinating how much you know. You know, take the anime community um, as an example. Um, there are anime community. You, know, you go to a comic con or anything like that yeah. uh, anywhere. Massive, yeah. There are these massive, just very fervent communities, um, you know, all around the globe, and um, and I think I we I believe that we can we can tap into that, um, and it it's great because I think you know, um, it's it not only it's not only great because we're sharing as kind of global citizens, but I think it it affects people's purview of. What is it? What is Japan? And what is that culture? And like, you know, people are exposed, and it and it gives them different. You know, I think media has this powerful ability to affect what we believe in our perceptions of the world and and our beliefs around other people that are different from us. And so, uh, I think that you know, as we start to kind of show like concretely different tiles and different content, as you log into your Disney Plus wherever you are, you see French content. Latin American soap operas, and you see Jap next to K dramas, next to Japanese anime. Um, I think it's this amazing. I mean, when I grew up, I didn't have access to that. I mean, I was flipping channels hoping to catch something right. um, growing up, right? But now it's sort of like I could literally watch a telenovela and then go watch Japanese anime, like back to back, and I get to program that myself as a consumer instead of you know whatever happens to be there. And I think that it's. It's really an amazing thing. I think it's going to affect people's perceptions about each other in the world. Yeah. So media is definitely becoming more of a global um, effect, um, and it's not just sort of a regional thing, and or and it's not just a, a Hollywood hegemony thing either, right? Yeah, um, to use absolutely. an unfortunate term. But yeah. I did want to bring up sort of the elephant in the room, given the region you're in, is China, sure. right? Or we can say Greater China, ha mm -hmm. however, <laughs> whatever satisfies <laughs> folks. Um, sure. China is a region that, um, especially U.S. companies, but I guess any company outside of China, um, is, is a hard region for them to crack, right? When mm -hmm. it comes to media, when it comes to content mm -hmm. in some form or another, mm -hmm. you can sell iPhones there, you can sell cars there, you can sell mm -hmm. physical goods there, and those things can trade relatively, you know, without, without too much problem. Media is different. So I'm curious, you know, as a Disney executive, how, how do you view that sort of, I guess it's like a missed opportunity or is it still an opportunity? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is just overall in Asia, right? Uh, regardless of being a U.S. company or not, how how is that perceived? I mean, it's such a huge part of the power center there. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, when we're talking about distribution. We're talking about content. We're, we're talking about everything but China, right? In that region. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean. I, obviously, I can't speak to specifically our particular China strategy and how we're how we're going at it right now. Um, but what I can speak to is I can say that, you know, we're very much focused on delighting the customer, right? And so, you know, wherever that is, um, and however we can legally do so, um, you know, we are going to try our absolute best to kind of get in that, um, in that. Uh, get in, get in, and and grow our business um, on behalf of that consumer, right? So I think, um, I think that, you know, again, for the various markets, there are different complexities. Like you know, again, like I said, rating systems in Korea, or systems in Japan, rating systems in Singapore, right? like you know, and so you know, we are doing our best to kind of like adhere and and make make um, you know how to say make inroads um, for all of those markets um, to try to. Um, again, deliver the content that we believe that customers want. And so I believe that in, in that respect, um, you know, it's kind of a global strategy as it is any particular market strategy to to kind of go in and give customers what they what they want to the extent that we can. That's fair. I, I guess, I mean, you did talk about the complexities around different regions have different rating systems, different different thresholds for what is or isn't allowed. I mean, yeah, I guess I'll press you on this point just one more time. I mean, is sure, it, no is problem. It, isn't China essentially the same thing? It's just a, a, maybe it's a different rating system or potentially a more strict rating system. Is it possible that should they have a, a, a rating system that said, you know what, we actually have a lot of content that sort of would totally, you know, pass muster with with your 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 rating system or your your filter for those kinds of things? Would that work for Disney potentially? It's like, sure, fine, we can do that. Yeah. I and again, I can't speak to our particular strategy in China right. or our particular game plan. But what I can say is that, 
you know, I think that the Chinese consumer is actually getting increasingly sophisticated, right? Um, and, um, you know, their access to the world um, is continually changing, um, you know, as times, as times go. And so I actually think, you know, when you look at the market right now, they are consuming an insane amount of content. Um, and, um, and so I think that, I th and, you know, with the population there and with the access that they're getting, I think that you're going to see that evolve um, more and more with time. But I think it's anyone's guess exactly how access and, you know, how those technologies, I think not only the media business, but I think the technology industry as a whole is kind of grappling with exactly what their um, China future is going to be. Um, and so I think honestly today, nowadays, it's anybody's guess. Uh, right, I, right. You know, that's fair. Uh, so, that's fair. Yeah, so, absolutely. I think, so, so I think it's sort of, um, you know, I think it's arrogant for any particular company to say, you know, this is how it's going to be. I think that the real truth is like, I think nobody really knows, um, you know, how that's going to evolve. But what I, again, what I can say is, I think the consumers are increasingly getting very savvy. I think the consumers are, um, you know, just like every other consumer, they're hungry for great technology, great storytelling. Um, and I think um, to the extent that I think any business can, they would love to um, serve those customers. Yeah, right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your background. You, you, you work at Disney, biggest media company in the world, but you, you have a, a big background in technology. You used to work at Google. Uh, the media industry itself is going through this transformation, right? Where it's, it's no longer just sort of making stuff. It's making stuff and how do I deliver to people, which is exactly what uh, the Disney Plus platform is about. And it's a transition that, you know, Disney and, and Warner Media and Discovery and all the com media companies are trying to make. Um, is it going fast enough? Given your background in technology, do you see that happening fast enough? Or do you think it, it's sort of on the pace that it should be or could it go faster? Can you repeat the question? Could, could what go faster? Just the, the, the pace of this transition, right? From media uh, companies adopting and adapting to technology. Because let's think about it this way. Like streaming is sort of a, a no-brainer in a lot of ways, right? It's easy to use. Most homes have broadband. Cable television, satellite television is the old way of doing things, but it's still around. It's still very expensive. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. still pay for it. Um, and despite the transition that these media companies are making towards streaming, they're not making it wholesale, right? In other words, ESPN and Disney Channel and, you know, uh, ABC Network in the States are, are still largely on your, your cable or your satellite mm -hmm. service, um, not on Disney Plus necessarily, right? So that's mm -hmm. an example of, well, they're holding back a little bit. They're making the transition slowly, is, is what I'm saying. Um, as, a, as a person with a background in technology who's, yeah. who's worked in Silicon Valley, do you see that, that that culture changing at Disney? Is it changing quickly enough? Um, and maybe not necessarily specific to Disney, but just overall in the in the media industry, the way you see it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, you know, I've been through a few of these transitions. As you said, like, I'm a child of Silicon Valley. I grew up, my I, I started my career there and grew up there. And I've kind of observed a few of what I would consider these inflection points. So, you know, like, um, not that I have ever used um, any of these illegal music download services <laughs> or um, any of these other services. However, I'm sure we all know someone who has. Um, so I think, um, I think in the music industry, kind of like that distribution method kind of came in full force, right? And I, you know, you remember Napster and then it moved yep. to iTunes and then there was the iPod. And then, you know, I used to carry around these like 10 CD, like little yes. booklets. That would kind of exactly. flip around, yeah, you know, or you'd um, zipper it open and you'd have, zipper yeah, it open, exactly. you have yeah. it in your car and, you know, and then, you know, you got these MP3 players that would carry a thousand of those. Um, yeah. But, whoa, look at this. Like I have all. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so if you remember though, I mean, I think that industry, I think what's interesting as an observation, generally speaking, that industry, the consumer jumped first, they went into physical digital downloading and they embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, and then afterwards, you know, I think the business, you know, business kind of caught up to the consumer, right? Um, and I think, um, and I think that's that's true of most of these disruptions. The consumer drives the change; they want a change, um, right. and whatever business can actually deliver the change that the consumer wants ends up, you know, making money, money yeah. right? Yeah, making the money, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think um, I think I think the same truth is here, which is that the consumer has made the jump 
um, if, and it's not, it doesn't, you don't need to pay for $5 million of research. Just look, you know, my niece or like, look at anyone's like, you go to, you know, I go to Thanksgiving and you see five-year-olds and six-year-olds um, kind of moving around and, you know, you know, my, my, um, my niece goes up to the microwave trying to touch it and like move it <laughs> around uh, because she thinks it's a touch screen, right? Right, and, right, of course. And she's like four or five years old, right? Uh, and so I think that's that's the customer that we're gonna be interacting with. Um, that's the future, right? And if you, and I, I remember, you know, we were reminiscing about like, hey, you know, like, do you remember like when this happened and we were talking about TV commercials and et cetera and like, the te- my my teenage you know like you know they just they just have no idea like why would you wait for a TV why wouldn't you just press pause go take care of whatever you need to do and then come back and press play this concept of like non linear linear viewing for them um, is you know you know rushing home at seven o'clock to watch this show that you oh, know only right. shows yeah. Thursday so, uh, I I think that, so I mean it's a long way of saying I think the consumer has moved on. Right, yeah. um, and so I think the the trick for all businesses is to catch up to that consumer and deliver to them what they are looking for, right? Which is basically nonlinear viewing when and where they want it on the device that they so choose. Um, and so I think to the extent, um, I think that most businesses at this point, I think, are there in the sense that I almost think that the technology to serve that is almost a commodity at this point, right? Like you press play. You almost all the services you press play, you rewind, you can watch it on multiple devices. I think that aspect of it, you can go now and if if you're a big company, whether you're Disney or even a small company, there's like third parties that will, you know, offer you a video player, like a white label video player that you could then label or brand whatever you want. You know, whereas if you just rewind like three years ago, if you wanted to be in streaming, you had to build it all from the ground up yourself, right? Um, And so I think that we're, we're moving pretty fast and we're starting to commoditize some of the tech pieces, you know, the, especially the player and the basics. Um, and then you're starting to see kind of incremental evolution, you know, for example, um, uh, that, that you see on like, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, double tap to fast forward or what have you, right? Um, I, you know, on some, you, so you see these incremental evolutions in UI and UX, but for the most part, most of the players are similar. So I think that's all that to say is, where I think it's going to come back to again is is the content. This is going to be fun. Like this particular business is going to be fundamentally a content game. And as as the technology pieces become commoditized, and everyone's on a phone, or everyone's on TV, or everyone's on a tablet, or everyone's on a PC, and you can press play and fast forward and do linear and all the all that jazz, you know, increasingly I think that it's going to come back to like, do you have the show that I want to watch? Right. That you yeah. just it comes down to the content. Um, Absolutely. Uh, content is expensive. Content is hard. Um, Absolutely. Last few minutes we have here. I wanted to ask a little yeah. bit about your your own background in terms of you know as you said you 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 grew up in Silicon Valley. Your that's your your background. Your professional mm-hmm. background. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a lot of Asian Americans, you know, we, we choose a certain path, right? Of a very sort of professional, uh, white collar sort of path, which is doctor, lawyer, engineer. I think technology <laughs> is now a big part of that that path. Yeah. Um, what made you make, you know, what inspired you to sort of make the jump, the switch into media? Because that's not typically mm-hmm. a route um, for for Asian Americans and, and generally even for people who have a technology background like you do. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, again, the best answer is a simple one, which is quite simply, I love the content. You know, I think, um, you know, I wanted to work at, you know, Lucas for Star Wars and then right. did, that didn't work out. And I wanted to work at Marvel and that that didn't work out. Um, and then Disney called and I was like, oh, cool. They bought the last two companies that I really wanted to work at. Um, and so when they came calling, um, it was an easy, it was an easy decision to say, okay, this is stuff. I mean, you know, this is stuff that I've been reading comic books since I was like, you know, six or seven. Yeah. yeah. Same here, right? Little, you know, little X-Men comic cards and, um, you know, and that I'm, I'm that guy that's standing in line at Comic-Con, right. Um, <laughs> or, you know, Hall H or whatever. And so, I think it was for me. It's a. It was a, you know, um, it was a passion, deci- passion-driven decision. Especially, I, you know, I was. I got a little bit lucky in Silicon Valley with the, my first two jobs, um, and so I think that you know now I can kind of make decisions that I think a little bit more passion-oriented. So this is 
this is kind of a you know the place I've, I've always wanted to work. You so. always wanted it. Yeah. You've always wanted to be yeah. at that. You know exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. No, I I totally understand that impulse. Yeah. Um, but you're right. As, as an Asian American, I think it's extra. It's extra. How do you say this? Um, it's extra standardized from doctor, lawyer. There's like a menu, right? Um, exactly right. You you went off the menu. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, congrats on that. I think that's great. There should be more um, Asian Americans in, in the field. So, yeah. Jay, this was a very illuminating conversation. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time and uh, giving us your thoughts. And look forward to seeing more stuff coming out of Asia on Disney+. Plus. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Evan. Sure.